Welcome back, everyone. I'm Harry Potvin, and welcome back to another episode of The H Panel, the show where we bring on guests from all different backgrounds to talk mental health. Today, I have the absolute pleasure of being joined by professional hockey player Brock McGillis. He is a former OHL and professional hockey player, with his talents traveling the world from right here in Canada all the way to Europe and the United States. What's more impressive, however, is the journey that, that he has been on, becoming a huge advocate for the LGBTQ plus community, he is known for being the first player to come out as gay in professional hockey's history. You can find out more about him and what he's doing on his website, brockmcgillis.com, which I'll post in the description below. Uh, Brock, thank you so much for joining us today to tell your story. Thanks for having me. Before we get too into it, why don't you just tell us a little bit uh, about yourself? Like, what made you choose hockey as a sport, like, growing up? I mean, I'm, you know, your stereotypical Canadian kid. My dad loved the sport, all my uncles and aunts and everyone in my family was, you know, hockey minded. I'd go to family gatherings and there'd be a hockey game on in the background. I became a stereotype. I um, grew to love it at a young age and you couldn't get me away from the rink. I grew up down the street from an arena and my parents would drop my meals off at the rink because I wouldn't leave. Anytime my team was short of goalie, I would jump in. I would get on the ice. As a kid, I was probably on the ice 12 to 15 times a week, just on my own volition. Like, I wasn't pushed or forced or driven. I, I'd carry my own bag down the street and go and do it. I just loved it that much. It's very convenient when it's, like, right down the street, too. That makes it really nicer. Yeah, and it was a small town, and my dad knew the arena manager, so anytime nobody was on the ice, I would jump on, and it was uh, I was pretty lucky. Oh, yeah, that's really nice. So getting right into it, uh, you've been very open about you know how tough it was to uh, play as a gay hockey player. Can you tell <clears> us more about the struggles you had to overcome uh, while you were hiding your truth from everyone? Yeah, so in hockey, there's um, hockey is a very conformist sport. It's funny, I can go anywhere, whether it's a mall or a school or you name it, and I can pick out the hockey kids. They dress the same, talk the same, act the same, and it's because they spend so much time together and they're in these isolated arenas away from everyone. Right. I started to realize that there's only three things that were really talked about. Girls, partying, and sports. Yeah. Um, anything else was kind of taboo. Maybe music, too. I knew, I, I felt that if I was my authentic self, uh, coaches wouldn't want me on teams, teammates wouldn't want me on their teams, and, and I would be out of the game, and, and the game that I loved so much and spent so much time practicing would be gone. And, and the other reality I realized and as I got into my teens and started you know, puberty and recognizing that I had sexual attraction to men was that if I couldn't conform they would push me out and my whole identity was based off being a hockey player Yeah, because I had spent so much time doing it and I got really good and I was playing high levels. You become known as a hockey player. I was Brock McGillis hockey player. So I didn't want to give up my identity. And then, you know, cause it's all I knew for such a long time. It's what people, when they saw me would talk about, I couldn't just give that up. Yeah. And I didn't think I could be both. So I started to struggle and I became really depressed. And I had an anxiety disorder my whole life. It got worse. And um, I hated myself. I would, um, I, would, I would date girls. I conformed to, you know, I became like the stereotype of a hockey bro. Yeah. You know, like that gong show stereotype or one of those things. And I you know, became this hyper-masculine hockey bro that dated a lot of women and, and was really a womanizer and and conformed. And I would go home at night and people thought I had this sweet life. I was in the OHL. I was dating lots of any girls I wanted to date. And my buddies thought I had this, like, wicked life, but I'd cry. I hated myself. I wanted to die. And on more than one occasion, I tried to. Yeah. And... And it was predominantly due to language, this conformity that I saw and then the language I heard, language I heard in locker rooms, on the ice, at school, that homonegative language, people calling each other, you know, fags or homos, put each other down or, or making these like non-direct comments like, oh, that's okay. Yeah. Made me think it was bad or wrong. Made me think I couldn't be myself because in the sport, there's two ways to put each other down they feminized one another or they used that homonegative language and mm. it meant that you're less than 
Right. So I really struggled. Um, like I said, I, I tried to take my own life a few times because I just didn't know. Uh, by the age of 18, I started drinking daily. I drank daily from the age of 18 to 23. I was constantly injured. From the age of 15 until I retired in my late 20s, I had a season-ending injury every year. And there has to be a correlation. You know, like, my mental health was so poor and I was struggling so much and I wasn't open about it. Right. And and I wasn't sleeping. I was drinking. I was numbing with substances. I was numbing with not sleeping. I was suicidal. I was depressed and I was anxious and all of a sudden my body started to fall apart, you know? Yeah. So, um, that's in a nutshell, you know, kind of what it, what I went through. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think, you know, it's important for viewers to understand that like, I, I've covered this before, but like people kind of underestimate the importance of mental health. They kind of just brush it off because they don't realize that the brain is also linked to your physical health. It's linked to everything. Yeah, so a strong mental health is like equally as important as being healthy because, you know, on the injury side, I'm the same as you. Like, I've, I've struggled with mental health my whole life, and just year after year, there's been injuries, like, while I was swimming. So people have to realize how important it is for sure. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, they, they kind of go hand in hand. I think your mind or body sort of has a way to tell you to slow down or stop. Yeah. And, and I think for me, those were the injuries. It's like, you, you need to take a step back. Mm-hmm. So I'm struggling so much, but it, it's funny that if I get hurt, my mental health would deteriorate even more. Yeah. Because the only time I felt happy was when I was on the ice. That was my safe space, my, my zone where I didn't have to think about my sexuality, about trying to conform, about who might find out, the what ifs of my life. Nothing else mattered on the ice except for stopping pucks, you know? Yeah, it was like a little distraction for you. Completely. So it was my happy place. And then every time I got hurt, my happy place was taken away. So, you know, this isn't really on the same scale. Obviously, I've had a different journey. But I remember that, you know, coming out as depressed and suicidal for me personally was really hard because I was, I think it was mostly because I was scared of, you know, how my parents would react. And I know that, um, in an interview earlier, you stated that, um, as a young child, your parents kind of, uh, made it clear that they'd support you and love you no matter what, which is huge. Did this support from your family make coming out any easier? And what can you tell a viewer in a similar situation that might not have that family support? Coming out as, like, gay or coming out with my mental health struggles? I can touch on both. Um, coming out as gay, it definitely helped. My, my fear with coming out to my family was um, they were so involved in hockey. Yeah. My brother was a first-round pick in the OHL and played professionally. My, my dad scouted in the OHL and coached for playing junior hockey for over 20 years, over 30 years. I feared that they would hear the language commonly used in locker rooms and uh, stand up to it. Yeah. And in the process, accidentally helped me, which would jeopardize any opportunity I had. So that was my struggle with them. I, I knew they would be supportive. They were. Um, and it took a few things to kind of get me to tell them. I dated somebody for three years without a soul knowing. And um, after that, I knew I had nobody to talk to. Mm-hmm. And, and the only thing harder than kind of accepting yourself and being, you know, gay was being in the closet. Right. And hiding that now. Because now not only was I, I accepted who I was, but now not only am I hiding that, I'm also hiding a partner. But something else happened um, after I broke up with that person. Uh, I became friends with Brendan Burke, and Brendan's the son of Brian Burke, who ran the Toronto Maple Leafs and Calgary Flames, now works for Sportsnet. Yeah. And um, Brendan and I became really good friends really quick after he came out publicly. And then one day he sent me a text that said, I can't wait for the day that you're out to your family like I am to mine. And I didn't answer him because of those fears I had. Yeah. It would impede my ability to play hockey. And um, two days later, Brendan passed away in a car accident. Wow. Those were the last words he ever said to me. And I knew at that point I had to tell somebody. I had to tell them. And I sat my brother down and I told him. And he was like, yeah, so you're Brock. I love you. And then I told my parents. And they 
were totally inclusive and supportive of me, and and I'm grateful for it. In hindsight, looking back, I wish I had come out at 15. Yeah. In in hindsight, and this isn't to say, but if you have a supportive family and everything else, and or people in your life, or even you know um, somebody out there who sees this that wants to reach out to me, if I would have come out younger, I probably would have. I oh no, I definitely would have had my parents' support. And uh, they would have been able to get me the right resources to help me with my struggles. Not only would I have had a happier, you know, teenage, like adolescent life and, and into, you know, adulthood. They also think my hockey career would have gone on a different trajectory. Like I was ranked on the NHL draft list. I was, you know, negotiating contracts with teams when I tore my MCL at 19. So... I really think it would have shifted things for me and I could have had both. So ultimately, if you have people in your life that are inclusive and supportive, don't bottle it up. But first and foremost, you have to accept yourself. Right. And only you can accept you. Yeah. Acceptance from somebody else is bullshit. It's fake. It's an illusion. It's not real because it means they're above you. They can support, they can be inclusive, but they can't accept you because we're all equal. And if you don't have those people in your life, that's okay too. Or, or if people aren't, you know, because you can find people, you can find resources like myself out there. Um, or if the people in your life take it not great right away, that's okay. Because you gave yourself X amount of years. Give them a little time. They love you. They'll hopefully come around, and if they don't, again, there's people out there like myself who will support you. Right. In terms of my mental health, I don't think I ever told my parents how bad it was. They knew I'd struggled with anxiety I had since the age of like seven or eight, but I, they didn't know about suicide attempts and how deep it was until um, <laughs> I came up publicly and they read it in newspapers and right. saw it on television, Yeah. which I think was hard for them, <clears throat> you know, not... And, and again, they would have been supportive and I should have came out to them. And there's a lot of parallels between coming out with mental health and coming out with mental health struggles or mental illness and coming out with uh, being gay um, because it's all internal. Mm-hmm. It's not visible necessarily. There may be some signs, but it's not fully visible. It's not <laughs> like, you know, um, another minority like, oh, I'm a person of color. Mm-hmm. or another illness like, oh, I broke my wrist. Right. Right? It's all in t- inside, so it's not totally visible. And, and um, they had no idea how deep it was and how much struggle there was. And in hindsight, I wish I had told them earlier, again, for the same reasons. I think I, I'm, I'm lucky and very privileged to have a, a, a great support system, and they would have, you know – search the earth to find the right people for me to get me help and get me into proper therapy and get me, you know, if I need medication to make sure I was on the right medication and do all the steps needed so that I felt good. Mm -hmm. So ultimately in hindsight, I wish I had come out with both right away to them. And again, I think the same thing where it takes time, people aren't always going to, support right away because they're in shock. They may not believe it's real. They may be struggling with their own stuff and not recognize that, oh, this, you know, like it might parallel what they're going through Yeah. because a lot of mental illness is hereditary, you know, so they might be avoiding their own and in turn not want to deal with yours. But again, there's people out there, there's people like yourself, there's people like me who will support you and, and, and help you find the resources in your region to get the help you need. So, you know, we've kind of talked about uh, you coming out, you struggling with being open and accepting yourself and kind of everything along those lines. So I wanted to kind of take it back to um, talking about uh, the slurs that were involved in the locker room. You know, as an athlete myself, I've seen just how homophobic and how toxic like a locker room can really be. And like, I'm, I can't relate to the overall story just because I myself am a straight male. But even like when I was called, you know, those slurs and those words, like it still hurt. Like it, 
it still took an effect. So I can't even imagine, um, you know, I can't even imagine what it was like for you. Yeah. And, and I think it, it, um, it's really interesting because when straight men are called it, they might not all, but some might form a resentment to that community because of it. Right. So it leads to like an internalized homophobia. Um, even if you're not gay, right? And and resentment towards that community because you've been hurt, like essentially called that, and and it's been ingrained in your mind that it's less than. And I didn't get called a lot of names. I was lucky in that sense, but I heard it so much. Even jokingly, we'd call each other. And 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 don't get me wrong, I used it as much as the next person. Yeah. Um, I completely conformed to the culture and I used those words and I thought I had to. So for me, uh, looking at it, those words were the hardest part because I was like, the thing that everyone laughs at, the thing that everyone calls each other to put each other down, I am. And it made me resent myself. It made me resent my community it made me resent any thoughts I had that were gay. Anytime I questioned it, I hated myself. I loathed myself. I would rather be dead at that point than be gay. And and it, that was the toughest part. And it's something I focus on a lot, whether I'm talking at corporate settings, schools, whatever, is the language. It's the easiest shift we can make. Oh, yeah. You, you can shift your language. I, I um, When I retired from playing, I started working with athletes. I was working with hockey players, and I was working with about 100 daily. And um, I came to find out that they all knew I was gay. I didn't know that they knew I wasn't out publicly yet. At that point, I was open with my friends and family, but nobody in the hockey world. After I found out that they knew, I started to really observe their language. And I started to notice any time they'd say something homophobic, they'd freeze up and apologize to me. Yeah. And I would smile and nod and just shrug my shoulders or whatever. I thought, cool, maybe I'm creating this little shift. And then I thought, or maybe they apologize to me, but they call kids fags in the dressing room or on the ice or at school or whatever. And then one day I wasn't there. I wasn't uh, working with them. I had a sprint coach work with these athletes that day. And um, at the end of a two hour workout, the sprint coach told them they had 10 more sprints and a younger player who comes from a very progressive family, a super inclusive family, looked at him and said, um, this is so gay, I can't believe you're making us do this. And one of my older players who was already in the OHL and more, more ingrained in the culture, like been in it longer, yeah, looked at him and said, we don't say that here. Give me 50 push-ups. Oh, wow. And that was something, the kid got down and did the push-ups and that was something that my athletes adopted and started doing and not only did they do it there but they took it because these hockey players are social influencers um they took it to their teams to their schools to their peers and uh their friends started doing it and one night two people i never met were these 15 year old kids were on facetime this hockey player and this young woman and she said let's hang out he said no i can't i have practice tonight and she said, that's okay, you never want to hang out when I want to. And he looked at her and said, give me 50 push-ups right now. Love it. And she did them on FaceTime. Really? Yeah, that's and amazing. it's two people I'd never met. But that's the power of creating shifts and also the power of language, right? Yeah. Like, they were using this language that ultimately probably came from hockey culture and spread into the school to serve influencers and whatnot. But these 15-year-old kids in 20... 16 were saying oh that's so gay yeah like really yeah i know even now like you still hear it and you're like come on and and i think we're getting better we have people that are like come on but i i think people are afraid to step up yeah and really curb it because um twofold number one um they don't want to be presumed to be gay right as men especially uh, we we don't want to step up and stop that because we don't want to be presumed to be it. And then um, number two is um, the thought that we may be the next person teased. The only time we do, and it kind of goes back to 
the story I just told and why I do what I do now is uh, to humanize these issues. If you know somebody in your life who is gay, you're going to be more likely to go, you know what, man, my brother's gay or my cousin's gay or my buddy's gay. Like, really, you're going to say that? Yeah. And, and we can justify it or put that almost reason behind it. So it's like, I'm not gay. Don't worry, I'm not gay. But, you know, my buddy is, so could you not? Yeah. Right. Instead of just saying, can we not? And until we get to that point, then there's still some deep stuff there yeah. that we have to get past. Those are hurdles we have to climb past. Right. There's still a lot of work to be done for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like you said, there has to be a shift because right now, you know, it's they're just words, right? But they're so negatively charged and there's so much negative power towards them. Like it's almost like we have to do a complete 180. And when they're used so frequently, they become ingrained in your mind as being that, you know, it's like being pounded into your brain over and over and over how bad it is. Yeah. And then you look at yourself and go, wow, am I that bad? Mm -hmm. Like what's wrong with me? Right. Is I saying no? And that's why when I, when I do a lot of like major, uh, TV interviews or different things. One of the first things I say, or at some point I, I make sure this gets in there, but I say, I love being a gay man because not, I love who I am or anything like that. I love being a gay man because nobody's heard that. Those kids that are struggling. have never heard that. Yeah. They've never heard somebody say they love being gay, especially on that big of a platform. Exactly. So that's where, you know, it'll reach masses. And if I can go, I love being a gay man, maybe it'll get them to shift, you know, and all that negative they'd heard about it for so long, maybe it'll shift a little bit. Maybe it'll get their parents to rethink things. Maybe it'll, like, open up conversations or, or at least critical thought. Right, yeah. That's where it starts. You got to get people yeah. talking. Exactly. I had another question, but you kind of just answered it. Um, I was going to talk because uh, I went to Toronto Pride last summer. Yeah. Uh, and it was, it was actually my first time. And I was, like, absolutely blown away by, like, the, ex the feeling of, you know, acceptance and love that was, like, actually in the air. It was, it was like, it was emotional because it was like, wow, everyone here is so accepting no matter where you came from. And I also went to my first drag show, and that was amazing. Oh, like, fun. Yeah, like... Wh where did you go? Oh, man, what's that bar called? Um, cruise? What is Yeah, yeah, Cruise. I went to Cruise. Okay. And yeah. there was also, like, um, at Dundas Square, there was a drag show yeah. being done. Wow. Like... I went with a couple people I just met and they were kind of hesitant to bring me because I guess there's like this reputation that like athletes are, you know, super manly and whatever, which is like a thing, I guess. But they were like, are you sure you want to come? I was like, yeah, why not? And it was just, I had so much fun. And yeah. drag's really fun. I love drag. I'm a big, um, have you ever seen RuPaul's Drag Race? I love that show. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I, I do a TV show with them. Yeah. Yeah. States. Yeah. That's so awesome. I, I love it. Yeah. yeah. It's so much fun. So I kind of was going to lead that into the, you know, the question of what else can be done. Well, I, I, I mean, there's always more that can be done beyond language. Uh, allyship is huge. Yeah. Um, asking questions, learning, take the time to learn things. There's always things we can learn. Like I, I, I learn about the community all the time. You know, I have to, I mean, it's my job, Right. but, um, you know, three years ago, I didn't know what pansexuality was. I didn't know what panromantic was. Um, I wasn't as fluent on trans, even as a white cisgender gay man learning about privilege. Yeah. You know, and the privilege I have within my community and, and why I need to use my voice to uplift those with less privilege. Right. And to hopefully one day give them platforms, you know, to share their stories. There's m always more that can be done. Um, embrace, celebrate, tell people they're loved. Engage with people when you hear them use homo-negative language. Yeah. Because it, it's easy to come at people and go like, oh, what the hell are you doing? Like, why are you talking like that? But they're not going to, like, that's creating barriers because we're coming at them with the same energy they're using, yeah, right? So progression. it's like this. But if we engage and educate them and go, like, don't you have a gay relative or a trans relative? And do you think that would impact them if they heard you saying that? Right. Now we're getting them to think. 
you can't tell people what to do. Yeah. But you can lead them to good decisions. You can get them to critically think, and that will lead them down a path that they're going to be, you know, more receptive to hearing and, and to learning and to shifting their thoughts because it impacts them. Until it impacts us, so you can see it with right now in society, and I don't know when this is going to air, but um, coronavirus. Yeah. You know, the people that's not impacting, we saw the spring breakers. Yeah. All going to, you know, and, and now they're all getting it. Yeah, I, I know. It could be, you know, they, they're not necessarily going to die from it, but they can be infecting others who will. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, like, geez, we shouldn't have done that. You know, and, and when you humanize an issue for somebody, when it, when it impacts their life, whether it's a relative of theirs, whether it's a friend of theirs, whether it's, you know, somebody they know, they're going to be more likely to shift. Yeah. And we have to remind them of that because the reality is everyone knows somebody. Yeah. Same with mental health, mental illness. Everybody knows somebody who, like, I, everywhere I go, I say who here knows somebody who's part of the LGBTQ plus community. I've yet to go to a place where there aren't at least 90% of the hands up. Yeah. And it's probably the same thing with who knows somebody who suffered from depression, anxiety, whatever, name it. And, and they go along the same lines, right? And um, everyone knows somebody. So we have to do a better job of reminding them. Yeah. And that'll lead to chefs. Yeah, for sure. So that's all I've got. Um, awesome. This last little bit here I do with my guests, it's kind of like, you know, a quick little plug for whatever you've got going on. So if you've got anything going yeah. on that you want the viewers to know, now's the time. Well, Mel, um, we're about to film, well, we were about to film, uh, it's postponed right now, but season two of This Is Shit on Wild Presents Plus, uh, it's a show where um, uh, we all have shit. We're all dealing with something. Yeah. And, and... Ultimately, when we're struggling, we think we're the only ones in the world who are. But we're not. We all are. Yeah. You know, and and it's uh, we're not special. We we think we're special in that sense, but we're not. Yeah. Um. So it's about dealing with our shit, and and by recognizing that other people have it, have shit, it takes the power away from it. It's not as significant as we think it is. So season two will be, season one's out, season two will be filming um, once we're out of quarantine. I'm about to start a podcast um, with, uh, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say, but uh, Sportsnet and uh, Rogers. Oh, awesome. Yeah, uh, so that will hopefully be recorded and starting again once we're out of here and... and um, other than that, I, I just uh, traveling around. If anyone needs a public speaker for an event, please feel free to reach out. Love it. You yeah. Can find me on Instagram at Brock McGillis33 or Twitter at Brock underscore McGillis. Perfect. Yeah. And I'll put that down in the description below for anybody who's interested. Once again, Brock, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. I really appreciate that. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, have a good one and stay safe and healthy. Yeah, you too. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. All right. Take care. Take it easy. All right. Bye. Thank you guys again for watching another episode of the H Panel. That one was with Brock McGillis, the professional hockey player. That was definitely a really important episode, and I'm really glad I got to you know, speak with Brock about some issues that I personally have seen you know, far too often with self-acceptance and, you know, homo negative language in sports so it was really cool to get him on and talk about uh, what we can do as a society to you know progressively make it better other than that guys like comment subscribe uh, thank you again for listening in i really appreciate it spread the word uh, i'll see you guys next time peace